Hello, I'm Mark Segrist filling in for Dan Jones. This week on Interchange, is there really a vision for Milwaukee? The impact of a court ruling on Wisconsin politics. How different was it during Patrick Lucy's time? And the legendary high school coach isn't done yet. Joining us on tonight's panel, longtime newspaper columnist Joel McNally, veteran broadcaster and political analyst Kevin Fisher, communications and public relations professional Denise Calloway, and education consultant and job creation expert Gerard Randall. Rick Horowitz joins us a bit later with lessons from a master political teacher. You won't want to miss it. Topic number one now. Has Milwaukee become a complacent community? Are we lacking a voice, passion, or vision uh, challenging us to do something better? We heard a lot of talk this week about improving the city's skyline, but where's the master plan for job growth, employment readiness, safe streets, and diverse neighborhoods? Does anybody care, or have we lowered our expectations living day to day and hoping for the best? Just what is the state of Milwaukee these days, Ms. Calloway? Well, I think the state of Milwaukee is one where there is a bit of promise and hope, but I don't know that we have a real, a real plan that is cohesive. Um, we have pockets of things that we'd like to be able to do downtown. There's a feeling that we need to do something about the Bradley Center. There is a feeling that we need to figure out what else we need to do in the Menominee Valley, what needs to happen along the 30th Street Industrial Corridor. But you really don't see a vision. Where's kind of the master plan? So we'll say these are the things that we need to get done. And most importantly, and this is what I think concerns me the most, we're talking about things we need to do, but I don't see what the outcomes are that we expect. To, to happen from those. So obviously it's kind of easy with the Bradley Center. Um, we would like to see, um, or some people would like to see, a new <laughs> arena that would be state of the yard and that would keep the bucks here in town. Um, but when we take a look at some of these other issues, what do we really want to be able to accomplish? For that matter, how does having a new Bradley Center fit into an overall plan for development and growth in downtown Milwaukee? Mm -hmm. um, we have not done a good job of figuring that out, and I don't know how many times we've talked just on this show alone about what we're going to do with Wisconsin Avenue. Mm -hmm. It's where's, a real challenge. Where's the passion, folks? Where's the passion? You know, part of it depends on who's doing the envisioning or who's doing the visioning. Um, bricks and mortar are easy to do. Uh, the Greater Milwaukee found a uh, Greater Milwaukee Committee, when it was first formed, was first formed around bricks and mortar kinds of issues. The uh, County Stadium, the Marcus uh, Performing Arts uh, Center, those kinds of things you can easily get the business community to wrap its arms around and to say, this is what we're going to do. The harder issues are those social problems that are impacted by everyone's attention being diverted to the easier things to tackle. And as a result, they just tend to fester and no one really has uh, a comprehensive plan because the people who should be involved in helping to craft the vision for the future aren't even at the table. They aren't even listened to. Well, who needs to step up in your opinion, Joel? <laughs> well, it's kind of hard to step up if you keep losing resources. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the Bradley Center. As soon as the Bradley Center project was identified as the number one project for the business community in this in this town then suddenly the convention center district is trying to piggyback off that when uh, you know you already needed to raise three or four hundred thousand dollars million dollars I'm sorry uh, you know for the for an arena that uh, no one is ready except for the old owner and the new owners uh, to put money into yeah uh, you know the only uh, the only way Miller Park got created was there was a governor a Republican governor yet uh, who who wanted to do things who who wanted to you know create things who wanted a lots of uh, legacy around around not only in Milwaukee but around the state uh, and obviously now you have a governor who's taking resources away from Milwaukee, very specifically, you know, dismantling lots of lots of things. I, I, I don't see any interest uh, he has in putting any money into either a convention center or an arena. Uh, and, you know, we're, the city is just barely hanging on as they keep losing more and more. And, and it's pretty hard. Yeah, you know, it, it just amazes me. I agree with with Gerard that the number one priority of the business community wouldn't be jobs, 
Uh, you know, in fact, they couldn't even get the governor that they elected to uh, you know, accept a billion dollars in federal funds to create jobs in this town and and uh, and around the state. Uh, you know, that would be have been connected to high speed rail, which you know, business always says transportation is really what produces economic development. Are we collectively asleep at the wheel, Kevin? I mean, do we are we as much to blame as as, as leadership? We meaning you. <laughs> Uh, in the royal, in the I, royal sense. I don't think so. Um, uh, let me inject some some positive uh, notes here. Uh, the state just a couple of weeks ago announced that uh, its two-year project, Transform Milwaukee, which had a goal of uh, $200 million of both direct and leveraged investments, had actually surpassed its goal of two, and made two, had invested $215 million dollars in, in the city of Milwaukee from one end of the city, the 30th Industrial Corridor that you referred to, Denise, all the way to the uh, airport. Um, and, and more obviously needs to be done. And it's not just the state. The city was a partner in that. Uh, minority chambers of commerce, mm -hmm. small bu businesses, mm -hmm. uh, nonprofits. So I think there's an excitement. Yes, people want to do something, but there's no universally adhered to playbook or manual that we go to. I think we all want what's best for Milwaukee because it, it supplies one-fifth of the, of, of the employees in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, M Milwaukee is the, the economic engine for the state. As, as Milwaukee goes, so goes the state of Wisconsin. But I don't think there's any a, a consensus on how we revitalize Milwaukee. And, and Milwaukee has a lot going for it. It has major elements of infrastructure already in place, freight rail, airport. The port of the port of Milwaukee, uh, the, the, the highways. Mm -hmm. So we, we we have components that I think major industries would be interested in. It's it's just that I think we need cheerleaders like Tommy Thompson. Uh, we need vi more visionaries, and we need a consensus. Everybody wants what's best, but we can't agree on how to get there. But you look at other cities and they figure it out. I think yeah, that's do. what is cities are frustrating. Um, Indianapolis, yep. um, which I used to live and work in, and when I was there, it was called India No Place because there really wasn't much or going Nap on. Town. Or Naptown. <laughs> uh, there, there, there was a mayor and then a series of both uh, other elected and civic officials who came together and said, we're going to develop a vision for this town that is both going to grow the economy and give it an identity. Collaboration and they did was that. the key. It was the key. And they it gave was the folks key. a reason to come. Right. It, it gave, gave people a reason to come, and it's something that continues to work for Indianapolis even today. But it takes and money. It, it does take it money. Does. You can't, a vision doesn't do you any good if, if no one's and, willing and, to put any money in. And and it's, and, but it's on. hard to raise all that money. So you're right, but it's hard to raise it. Have to raise, uh, we have to move on now to topic number two. And a federal court, uh, appeals court, the Seventh Circuit Court, that is, says Wisconsin's campaign finance law is bad, much of it unconstitutional. The concern is about restrictions on political speech, specifically issue ads by independent groups, also concerns over other related matters. Looks like the legislature will have to do a rewrite. So what does this all mean for the future of Wisconsin politics, Mr. Fisher? Well, it means that just what you said, uh, the legislature is going to have a very major challenge on its hands because they're going to basically have to do a rewrite. And it's not easy. The, those, those, those laws, those campaign uh, laws are very complex to the point where all these restrictions that were put in place, I mean, you want people to run for office. But if the only people that can understand the laws, the election laws, are highfalutin lawyers, then that de that detracts people from wanting to run. And, and that's not good for the process. You had, um, I'm sorry to say, but you had partisan bureaucrats who ignored what the United States yeah. Supreme C Court specifically laid out. It's almost as if Citizens United, whether you like that ruling or not, mm -hmm. didn't exist. So they came in with all these broad and vague restrictions that is an affront to, to the First Amendment rights of, of people that want to put out issue ads. It's, it's, it's not good. You want more players involved in the process. It makes for a much more healthy, uh, uh, a healthier society. So now, now the legislature is going to have to bring in all the experts and rewrite the law because rewrite the law because uh, the government accountability board went in and made all kinds of changes, all kinds of restrictions on First Amendment rights. It's going to have to be cleaned up, but it, it's, because of the complexity, it won't be easy. And, and the bottom line is, how is this going to change politics? Uh, it'll have much more 
money flowing into politics. It'll, it'll, the, the effect will be exactly what actually Kevin wants to happen, which is millionaires and billionaires to control our political system. You guys I, aren't I, agree, nice tonight, huh? I, I agree, in fact, that <laughs> uh, under this United States Supreme Court, campaign finance reform is unconstitutional. Uh, and and the federal judges and everyone else have have no choice but to make those kinds of decisions. And that is is very bad for free speech because what it does, it says money is speech. Corporations are people. Uh, a couple of absurd ideas because what that means is the people with the most money can speak the loudest and drown everybody else out. Uh, now that's not a First Amendment protection. Uh, that is just the opposite. It destroys the First Amendment because it removes the voice of the majority of the citizens, and only the very rich have a voice. Uh, so uh, it's a. It's, Citizens United was a terrible decision. It will be a long time, and probably it will take a change in the U.S. Supreme Court before we can actually get back to what both Republicans and Democrats used to agree on. Remember, it was the you know, McCain-Feingold law that tried to get some of the money out of the system, and it's now no longer possible because of these horrible decisions. Now, I just want 10 seconds here. Uh, Wisconsin right to life brought brought a yes. suit against yes. against sure these, these these restrictions and I, I i know a lot of the folks at wisconsin right to life i bet you and, do. and they are that is not a an organization made of millionaires and billionaires but, but here's the problem here's the problem we will no longer be in a position where we know who is paying for these ads mm. that so greatly influence our our government it, we will be in a position in a short period of time where we will have the best government that rich people can pay for. Because that is what will influence it. I think as a citizen, I believe in the right for people to have free speech. Absolutely. Except but I don't corporations. Think, but I don't, but uh, corporations are not people. Yeah, they, well, corporations are, they, are ro not they robots? people. Just because they are they're not, not people. Says, though. Corporations <laughs> are not people. And I think, I, I, I agree with Joel. I believe that my First Amendment right is compromised because I now am not able to easily find out who paid for these ads and what they're trying to influence. In this country, we have long been a group of people who felt not just hearing what people had to say, but knowing who said it was a critical part of our democracy and for us to make informed decisions. Part of making an informed decision is knowing where the information has come from, and we no longer have that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gerard, well, concerns? I may be the only one on the panel who's ever run for political office. Didn't win. Um, That's because I couldn't vote. But for in I, my belief is the thank you. Uh, the uh, in Wisconsin uh, and in the rest of the country as well, money has always been a driver. I ran in '76. And money was as much of an influence then. It was who could you access to get to support your campaigns. And the, the vote split for me was pretty much comparable to the amount of money that was spent, two to one loss. Uh, but twice as much money uh, from my opponent in that campaign. I look at this particular decision and I say, well, in some ways, it will balance things out. 501c4s are uh, certainly going to be a lot more prolific uh, in our experience. They will uh, not just be the unions, uh, but other issue-oriented groups that uh, will come to the fore and have money that they will put in. And, and the anonymity, I don't think won't, I don't think it will be as much of a factor as the reality that there will just be more and more and more of these organizations who will push ads out to reflect a particular Well, before viewpoint. this decision came down from the Seventh Circuit, to what degree had Wisconsin state regulators, regulators already backed off on the enforcement of the existing law? I don't think that they had backed off at all. That much? So you, you collectively... I think it was more targeted, yeah. but I don't think they'd backed so off. So collectively, you folks think that this is going to have a definite impact on the future of Wisconsin. It'll have a yes. good impact because there'll be <laughs> there'll be more players. The people who want to donate $25 and stay informed by reading the paper are going to going to forums, can still do so. They can watch te uh, 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 television debates. Uh, but you're going to have uh, corporations 
people who want to put out issue ads will now be able to do so and not worry about having their rights infringed because of all of these vague, broad restrictions being in place. Billionaire, and billionaires have never, you know, had their voices lowered. Right. And in fact, this is just, un, uh, you know, unleash, you know, gushes of, of billions of dollars. Uh, into the Republican Party. So you're not party. for free speech for billionaires. See, I'm no, it's not just for Republicans. And we have to move not on to the topic. Ground out everyone else. Number three. Former Wisconsin Governor Patrick Lucey died last week. He was 96 years old. Mr. Lucey was an active public servant. In 1977, for example, Jimmy Carter appointed him ambassador to Mexico. Three years later, he ran with independent candidate John Anderson for the White House as his running mate for vice president. It was a compelling time for American politics, and Patrick Lucey and his peers were in the thick of it. How different was the political stage itself back then, Mr. Randall? Very different. I remember in 1971, I was sitting in my dorm room and watching the, uh, the TV news, and the deal had just been done that created the UW system. Uh, by, virtue the, the, by virtue of him. Yeah, he was the... He was a master politician in terms of being able to get people into a room and and creating some type of compromise uh, because the, the Republican legislature at that time was not too keen on moving forward with this merger. But was that the ability... education establishment wasn't happy. They, no, they weren't. And and so th yeah. that that was his so group that certainly had its issues with the merger so, and, and the so Republicans who had so their own. For him to pull that off. It that was, was a, quite a feat. It was quite a feat. But was that his talent or was it the fact that he oh. was representing folks in that era, in that time where, I, where there was I think a spirit it was, of collaboration? It was his talent. Look at it who was. his contemporaries yeah. were. You had John Reynolds, who, yeah. uh, former governor, federal judge that uh, uh, implemented the uh, desegregation right. uh, order. Right. You had uh, Proxmire, who was a contemporary. Yeah. Even if you cross the aisle and you look at guys like Lee Dreyfus, uh, contemporaries. Th these are, I think, very, very different times in this sense. You don't have people who are willing to take an idea and explore or or massage that idea with others who may disagree with Keep you Keep in mind that before... He was governor. He was chair of the Democratic right. Party. Mm -hmm. And for, I think it was for like 25, 26 years, uh, the Democrats had not had a majority in the state right. legislature until he came in and played hard nosed politics, yeah. the kind that hadn't really been seen in Wisconsin until. Uh, uh, until mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pat, Pat Lucy, which was a talent of his, and he kind of turned ar things around for the Democrats. He kind of re reformed his party. And I, re I read something about him that I think really, really says a lot, and that is his legacy might be that you don't have to be really, really, really popular in order to be effective. Right. Yeah, yeah. And he certainly enjoyed his run with John Anderson. <laughs> it, it, it appeared that he just enjoyed that campaign. Well, and, and imagine, you know, Anderson a Republican and, mm -hmm. yeah. and Lucy right. a Democrat on a ticket together. I mean... And the, that's partly because there was a falling out between him and the president, right? right? right. Well, right. there was that. Well, that was there, uh, yeah. But, but, but I want to follow up on, on what Gerard was saying about the creation of, of the university system as we know it in this state. Because the, uh, the other really important creation that I think he put together, actually at the urging of Henry Meyer from this town, uh, but but he could bring it off because Henry Meyer tended to alienate a lot of people, uh, and which was which was to put state money into the cities, right? Uh, and that was a, a revolutionary idea, and he created the whole revenue sharing with with the cities around the state. Which Henry Meyer loved, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, yep. it was he was yelling and screaming about it, but yep. it took low key. Pat Lucy to create it, uh, and he never uh, Henry Meyer never quite gave credit to Lucy because because <laughs> they kind of you know were you know rivals as much as anything, uh, but but also uh, on a on a Republican issue, uh, I remember a huge business tax cut, uh, the machinery and equipment that was which the offset. Still in effect. That's right, it absolutely is. But you know it wasn't like you know he he. He associated with Republicans. Uh, a very progressive Republican who followed him, Lee Dreyfus, actually worked very closely with Lucy uh, when he was at the university um, 
in yep. the university system. Uh, and, you know, that kind of broad vision where one side wasn't trying to kill the other side, they were actually trying to create something positive, that just doesn't exist anymore. In fact, many of those accomplishments are now being dismantled in education and, and revenue sharing for the cities. I don't mean to ignore you. 15 seconds. No, no, no. You, I, I you, missed covered, that, you missed that error. I, I missed that error, and I actually covered the um, campaign. Um, no, the, you didn't. You're yes, too I young. did. Well, <laughs> I was 12, I guess, when it happened. But the Anderson Lucy campaign, one of the things that was so unique about it and that was actually so refreshing was that you had these two candidates from different political parties. Yes. Finding that middle ground, right. which is where most Americans live. Yeah. Right. And to me, that was the thing that was fascinating about that campaign. Yeah. It was a glimpse of what we could have. And I think one of the legacies that Patrick Lucy leaves is that, yeah. that there is a way for us to work together and to do those things that matter to a vast majority <clears throat> of Americans. Our challenge is to figure out how we get back Thank you there. for making that point. That was an excellent point. The political world was all abuzz this week over some things that a top Republican strategist reportedly said about a very prominent Democrat, not just any Democrat, but so far the runaway leader for her party's 2016 presidential nomination. Rick Horowitz was watching the dust up very closely and picking up plenty of pointers along the way. Say you got it into your head, who knows why, but just say you got it into your head to smear somebody, to raise all sorts of damaging questions and nasty whispers about someone. How would you do it? I mean, where would you go for advice? Who'd be your smear campaign role model? Well, you'd certainly have to consider this guy. After all, when it comes to throwing mud for fun and profit and political gain, who's better than Karl Rove? He's made a career out of it. You have to give him credit, that's what I say. I mean, you'd give credit to any man who found time to build a successful career while checking himself in and out of mental hospitals more than 30 times, wouldn't you? Not that I'm saying Karl Rove checked himself in and out of mental hospitals more than 30 times. Just that anybody who did would have had to overcome lots of obstacles, whether it's Karl Rove or some psychopath you've never even heard of. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not calling Karl Rove a psychopath. I mean, I'm not a doctor. Besides, if somebody's able to go out there and convince people to hand over tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to elect certain candidates, that's a real talent, even if practically every one of those candidates winds up losing. You know, it's almost like those millions of dollars had no effect. Like all that money wasn't even spent on the campaigns, but went into somebody's pocket instead, or some secret bank account in the Cayman Islands or somewhere. I'm not saying Karl Rove did anything like that. In fact, I'm sure he's got a perfectly good explanation for where all that money went. He'll just have to be more uh, forthcoming about it, instead of dropping out of sight for days at a time where nobody can find him. It's a pretty short flight down to the Cayman Islands, you know what I mean? And if the next time he pops up in public, Karl Rove does, he happens to have a suntan, you know, the kind of suntan that's consistent with a place like the Cayman Islands, well, I'm sure he has an explanation for that too. Which is why you'll never hear me calling Karl Rove an embezzler or a psychopath. No, sir, not at all. Or even a, now let it go. So where were we? Right, say you wanted to smear somebody. Thank you, Rick. Okay, here's a riddle. What happens to a high school basketball coach in Wisconsin with eight state titles, more than 600 wins, and strong opinions? Well, if you have a falling out with administrators at St. Catharines High School in Racine, you're shown the door only to be rehired. Coach Bob Letch earned another comfort behind win this week, and he ha his fans had his back all the way through it. Rather strange uh, turn of events, Mr. McNally. <laughs> How do you make sense of that one? Well, actually, uh, very early in my life, I witnessed something very similar to this. It was actually before all the revolutions of the 60s where protests changed things. Um, I was in elementary school and my two older brothers were in high school and in this small town in Indiana they fired the basketball coach. And everybody walked out of the school, the high school. I saw my, you know, my two older brothers out, you know, protesting outside the high school. <laughs> And, and I didn't even know you could do things like that. You know, <laughs> I, I, I really didn't. And now I know the rest of the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little like Hoosiers. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're an insider. I mean, how political does it become inside an athletic department at a high school? Oh, very. Really? Very <laughs> political, absolutely. Um, you know, when you calculate a move like that, um, you also have to kind of measure what the response is going to be and if you can wait out the response. 
and this was clearly a case where I don't think they calculated the response. They didn't. Um, at all. At all. You cannot take someone who is that highly popular. A legend. The, a, a legend. And treat them the way that you treated them. You, you did, They did a great job of creating this already popular man um, and making him a martyr. Mm -hmm. Like all I want to do is play for my kids, and, <laughs> you know. And so they were. As soon as that happened, they were toast. And the rap they on him was that he has a temper. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what? Uh, show <laughs> me a high school basketball coach that doesn't. doesn't have a temper and wipe the omelet off their faces. He's going to win the state title this year. He's got a very, very here's the kick on chance. this. The sport athletics is a significant part of the high school experience. Yes. And in a private school. It's all about the money. Can you convince these families to keep their kids in that school? And kids don't want to go where their sports teams are losers. And that's, that's why how, he's back. And that's how Bob, uh, Brother Bob saved Mesmer. Yes, yes. That's another illustration. It, you absolutely. You go to the parents. You yes. go to the core support. It's all about their children. Thanks for being with us. Hey, thanks for having me back. And good I'll to see have you again. Dan Jones will be back next week. Have a great weekend. You've done good.